Hey everybody, welcome back to the salon. Here we are again with another installment of this long running series. So today we're talking about, obviously, 1977. Now, I actually only turned five years old in September of 1977, so I actually wasn't really aware until later on of all the horror awesomeness that was unleashed in that, I guess it was kind of like a watershed year, I suppose. It was the year of... <laughs> So many, so many. <laughs> like, just all these amazingly cheesy nature run amok movies. Like, when I was looking at the list on Wikipedia, this kind of blew my mind. Day of the Animals, Empire of the Ants, Kingdom of the Spiders, Orca the Killer Whale, and Tentacles all came out in the same year, which that's crazy to me. I didn't even, like, realize that. Also, this was the year of some possessed vehicles, like the movie The Car, which actually I quite like, uh, some demonic high schoolers, Satan's cheerleaders, uh, and also voracious king sizes, deathbed, the bed that eats. Now, um, I'm going to tell you ahead of time, spoiler alert, none of these movies are going to be appearing in my top five, although... I do have some affection for most of them, other than Deathbed, which I kind of feel like that was such an amazing, like, incredible premise, and it was just kind of mostly wasted because the movie's mostly more or less boring, which is kind of a shame. But uh, just as in my last year's wrap-up, there are a handful that only just missed, like, the coveted, you know, top five spots. I actually have five honorable mentions for 1977, which means that if I wanted to make more work for myself, I could have made this a top ten list. But I don't, uh, so I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Um, I'll just give each of them like a brief shout out. So these are the five honorable mentions. Uh, they were Donald Kamel's Demon Seed, Wes Craven's The Hills Have Eyes, Michael Winner's The Sentinel, Mario Bava's Shock, and Gordon Hessler's TV movie, The Strange Possession of Mrs. Oliver, which I actually talked about at length on one of these videos a few weeks back. So now on to the main event in no particular order other than alphabetical. So anyone who knows me knows that I adore David Lynch's work. He is my favorite director by far. Uh, and actually, as I mentioned in my previous discussion about uh, the Winkies diner scene, which was in one of my like ten, like scariest uh, movie scenes ever videos, his movies, at least to me, feel like the closest thing to experiencing like a waking nightmare. You know what I mean? I think he really is very good at getting that across on film in a way that a lot of other filmmakers aren't. And Eraserhead, I feel like, is probably the best example of that. So Eraserhead was inspired by a couple of surrealist stories, uh, most notably Franz Kafka's The Metamorphosis, you know, the one where the guy wakes up as a giant cockroach, and uh, Nikolai Gogol's The Nose. Um, so basically, David Lynch places this kind of passive everyman protagonist, whose name is Henry Spencer, played by the great Jack Nance, into this bleak industrial hellscape that just kind of like hums with this really unsettling groaning, like this constant noise, which kind of highlights the fact that really he's nothing more than a cog in this massive machine that's completely out of his control. I mean, the sound design, in fact, is one of the things that makes a racer head so disquieting, not the only thing, the imagery is pretty fucked up too, but uh, the sound design is like really important. And actually David Lynch does mostly pretty much like all the sound for, not the music so much, but like all the sound design for his own movies. And he knows like very well how to make certain sounds and like certain frequencies that cause like viewers to be really, really uneasy. So he's really good at that. And here it's like particularly pronounced. So Eraserhead, I mean, it doesn't have, like, a coherent story as such, um, other than you got Harry with his big, you know, high hair, getting his girlfriend, Mary Axe, pregnant, and then having to deal with this constantly squalling thing <laughs> that she has given birth to. But... Even though the narrative isn't really the main thing, it doesn't mean that the movie is just like weird for weirdness's sake, because I do kind of feel like some people that don't really care for David Lynch, that's kind of um, a criticism that gets lobbed at him a lot, that he's just like being weird for the sake of it. But he's absolutely not. I mean, like his imagery and stuff like that, he's very intuitive, like his uh, filmmaking. And I kind of feel like even if he 
while he's making the film, even if he couldn't articulate like what it meant, uh, it does mean something. And I mean, you, it means different things to different people too. Like you can interpret his stuff in a lot of ways, but he's not just pulling stuff out his ass. Like it does actually have like really uh, a lot of symbolic meaning. And Eraserhead in particular, I think there's a lot to unpack in terms of like young man's uh, ambivalence, I guess, or maybe even abject fear toward fatherhood, uh, pregnancy, and kind of just settling into domestic life. Eraserhead seems like it frames what is, you know, seemingly a natural human proclivity toward, you know, settling down, to, you know, starting a family, procreating, blah, blah, blah. And it frames that in terms of just like utter grotesque, like, it's just disgusting, like, the way that it's shown. I mean, and in a way, too, it makes, like, the familiar seem, like, really ghastly, like, all the shit that he does. Like, he makes things ordinary situations and ordinary objects. Like, he makes them sinister just by dint of, like, just changing one little thing slightly or something like that. I mean, just that whole dinner scene in here with, like, the, the chickens and all that other kind of stuff is just so, so fucking strange. Now, very famously, Lynch kept the uh, whole kind of, like, makeup and construction of the monstrous infant prop a secret, which as far as I know, he still has not revealed to this day. Uh, many people have speculated that he maybe used like a skinned rabbit or maybe some other kind of fetal animal, like a lamb or something like that. Um, but he won't say like you could move it. It was like a puppet, but nobody's really entirely sure like what it's made of. The story goes, in fact, that David Lynch was so adamant about keeping uh, <laughs> the makeup of this thing a secret that he uh, the camera operator or whatever uh, cinematographer he would like make him wear a blindfold like while he was setting up the thing or like changing it or whatever just so he couldn't see what it was made of so whatever it's made of it's pretty fucking uh freaky looking that's for sure i mean eraserhead is just one of those movies that you have to see at least once in your life if you care anything about film as an art form uh it's also kind of really a movie that needs to be seen like to be experienced talking or writing about it doesn't really do it justice because you really have to kind of like immerse yourself in it I talked about this movie pretty extensively on uh, the salon before, and I realized that this maybe might be a little bit of an offbeat choice for a top five movie, but fuck it. I mean, I love this movie, and I feel like it doesn't really get much attention from the horror community at large. I mean, it's restrained, for sure, and, you know, some might even call it sedate or slow or something like that, but... There's just something about it. It has this, you know, it's the very eerie ghost story kind of vibes. And it also kind of has like a backdrop of like a murder mystery. And for some reason, like it just pushes all the right buttons for me. Like it really speaks to me. I don't know why that is. Um, it even has a seance in it, which is always a plus uh, in my book, you know, because I love movies with seances in them. So this is directed by Richard Loncrane, who also did the 1982 version of Brimstone and Treacle, which I talked about like on another post uh, that had staying in it. And it was based on a 1975 novel called Julia by Peter Straub. Uh, Full Circle, which is actually better known as The Haunting of Julia in the United States, but is known as Full Circle pretty much everywhere else, uh, including in its native UK, uh, actually stars Mia Farrow as a woman named Julia, duh, whose daughter Kate actually chokes to death at the beginning of the story, though it's not real clear whether she would have just died anyway, or if Julia's attempted kind of kitchen table tracheotomy that she does on her, like to try and get the piece of apple out of her throat that stuck, uh, was actually what killed her. So following a stint in like a sanitarium or something like that, like to recover from her grief and trauma and everything, uh, and a separation from her kind of assholey husband, Magnus, who's played by uh, Kier Dulia from 2001 A Space Odyssey, Julia actually buys her own house. She must be loaded because the house she buys, it's in the middle of London and it's really, really nice. Uh, you know what I mean? It's like some really expensive uh, real estate. I think it's like three stories and everything. I was like, holy shit, she must be fucking really, really wealthy. Uh, but yeah, so she gets her own house, but soon starts to suspect that maybe the spirit of her daughter, Kate, might be trying to communicate with her. But it turns out, too, that this ghost might not be as harmless as Julia perceives it to be. I mean, I just really like the whole 
atmosphere of this movie. Like the acting performances are great. The score is just like really, really somber and adds to the whole mood, which I love. And it's got like some really subtly spooky moments that have really kind of like stuck with me over the years. So, I mean, it might be an unorthodox pick, but it is definitely one of my favorite movies of 1977. So I'm sticking by it. So this is another movie that I've done a whole video about. So uh, I'll try not to repeat myself too much here. So although Lucio Fulci obviously is best known in, at least in the English speaking world, I guess, for his, you know, gory zombie flicks, uh, his Giallo movies are actually pretty rad too. And in my opinion, this one right here is his best one and easily one of his most underrated. I feel like it's one that even a lot of people that are into Lucio Fulci probably haven't seen or heard of, which I think I brought up on my whole video about this movie. So The Psychic follows this woman named Virginia, who's played by Jennifer O'Neill, who has had psychic visions since childhood. She's recently married a wealthy Italian man named Francesco, who's played by Johnny Garco. Uh, not Donnie Darko, <laughs> Johnny Garco. And uh, she decides, like, as a surprise to him, that she's going to fix up an old palazzo that he owns. But on the way there, she has this really disturbing vision, which consists of several seemingly random and unrelated images that are nonetheless like kind of scary and upsetting. So once she gets to the palazzo and she sees that the furniture and the layout of one of the rooms like matches some of the images in her vision, she starts an investigation into what she thinks is a past murder that occurred there. But as the movie goes on and as aspects of her vision start manifesting in real life, uh, you know, with context, which she didn't have before, it starts to become pretty clear that the psychic revelation that she received might be a lot more complicated than she first realized. So this one is almost completely lacking the, you know, the gnarly gore that Fulci is usually lauded for uh, by horror fans. But this one is still fantastic and absolutely worth watching. I I love everything about this one. I don't know what it is. I love the shot compositions. Um, you know, the acting is real solid. And the script, I think, is my favorite part of it. Like, the script was written by Dardano Sacchetti. And it's really, really suspenseful, and it's just like really, really masterfully constructed. I just love the way, I just love the the screenplay for this, uh, to be honest, if that's not too weird a thing to say. So if you're into Fulci's gore films and you kind of want to branch out and see like what the maestro could do in other genres, then uh, this is definitely one I'd recommend, especially if you're into giallo films. Although this is a giallo in one sense, but it does have a supernatural element. So it's like giallo plus, I guess. So David Cronenberg is another one of my favorite directors, and while I feel like he didn't really kind of hit his stride until The Brood, which came out in 1979, two years after this, Rabid is still a great flick. I mean, it's just full of his, you know, the stuff that he's kind of like known for that's this trademark, you know, freakish body horror, and also these kind of satirical jabs at... Uh, the corporate world and the medical profession in particular in this one. Rabid was actually remade in 2019 by uh, Jen and Sylvia Soska, but I admit that I have yet to see that version, although I do kind of want to see it. I've heard like mixed things about it, but I am kind of curious to see it, so I'll get around to it one of these days. But in the original, Marilyn Chambers, who, uh, you know, if you weren't around back then, was actually a porn star, uh, best known for Behind the Green Door. This was right when porn got real big and went mainstream. Uh, but this was actually her first non-adult film. Like, she had been looking to branch out and get out of porn. So, you know, David Cronenberg put her in the movie. And she actually does, like, a really great job, I think. So she's in this, and she plays a woman named Rose. And at the beginning of the story, she gets into a motorcycle accident with her boyfriend, who's, I think his name is Hart. Um, now, Hart isn't injured all that badly in the accident, but Rose is pretty fucked up. Like, she pretty much goes into a coma. She gets, like, burned real bad. So, like I said, she's kind of fucked up. Now, luckily, there's a medical facility very nearby that they get taken to. Unluckily, it's an experimental plastic surgery joint run by a doctor with the very dubious sounding name of Dan Keloid. 
So just for shits and giggles, I guess, the doc decides that he's going to try out a new skin grafting procedure on Rose. But unsurprisingly, it goes oh so hideously wrong. <laughs> So instead of the neutral skin grafts differentiating, like to repair the damaged skin and organs, kind of like stem cells, I guess, uh, the technique somehow causes a sort of mouth stinger situation to form in Rose's armpit. Don't you hate when that happens? I hate when that happens. It also essentially turns her into like a vampire, kinda. I guess technically she's, she's not undead or anything, but she can only subsist on human blood and she gets it by, you know, attacking people with her armpit mouth stinger thing, you know, as one does. So, and everyone she feeds on subsequently becomes infected and they start acting all zombie-like and then spreading the contagion to others. So Rabid ends up being basically an apocalypse type story. Um, with Rose as patient zero. I mean, like the infection spreads and like martial law gets declared, at least in Montreal. I don't know. I don't remember if it goes like worldwide or whatever. But yeah, I mean, this is like a weird, gross, kind of grimy little film. Uh, but it's actually like a big step up from Cronenberg's previous movie, Shivers, which was also great. Don't get me wrong. Um, I think I even picked it as one of my top five for the year that it came out. But this is definitely like a big leap forward uh, in his filmography. Like I said, even though I think that my favorite run of his films actually started with The Brood, which was two years after this, but you can definitely see his genius uh, in this one big time. So this is yet another movie that I've talked about at length, but I feel like Suspiria is just one of those movies that's kind of like at this point completely embedded itself in my DNA. I mean, I decorated my old house based on its uh, kind of Art Nouveau flourishes and its, uh, you know, super saturated, vibrant color palette. Uh, and I even designed a board game that was partially inspired by it uh, called The Three Mothers. Now, while I actually really did like the 2018 kind of reimagining of it, there's really no topping the 1977 classic. I mean, the visuals alone from the Dario Argento version would earn it a spot on this list, even if the story wasn't any damn good. Thankfully, though, everything about the original Suspiria is incredible. It's pretty much Dario Argento firing on all cylinders. It's also, I have to say the zenith of his collaboration with his then girlfriend, Daria Nicolodi, uh, who co-wrote the screenplay. She would be in a bunch of his movies subsequently, but she actually co-wrote this one. And I think that maybe goes a long way toward why it's so good. So this is actually, Suspiria was actually very loosely based on Thomas de Quincey's Suspiria de Profundis, which means size from the depths. And in particular, one essay that's in there that's called Lavana and Our Ladies of Sorrow. That's where it talks about the three mothers. So Suspiria, as probably most of you know, centers on a young American ballet dancer named Susie Banyan, uh, played by Jessica Harper, who is selected to study at this very prestigious dance academy in Freiburg, Germany. But from the first moment that she arrives, it's pretty evident that something is maybe kind of like off about the place. Like she arrives in the middle of a, you know, howling storm, which is actually a great opening sequence. She sees another woman apparently fleeing from the building in terror. She doesn't really know what the deal is with that. And then like she gets refused entry. She's like, hey, I'm supposed to be here. I, you know, I was late because of the storm and blah, blah. And they're like, go away. You don't, you don't, you know what I mean? Uh, so she comes back the next day and is like, what the fuck was the deal with that? But she's allowed in and they're like, yeah, we're sorry. There was all kind of chaos, blah, blah, blah. But once she kind of gets in there and starts studying and, you know, has her room and everything like that, uh, the weird shit just continues to escalate thick and fast. And Susie uh, soon begins to realize that the school might be, is, uh, a front for a sinister coven of witches. 
So, like, everything about this movie rules. I mean, it's easily one of my favorite horror films of all time, not just of this particular year. It's breathtakingly stunning to look at. You could just watch it without the volume because it's, like, every single shot, every single frame of it is beautiful. Um, and it's just, like, amazing to look at. Uh, the score is, like, exquisite. It's, like, super bombastic, and it's just, like, so, so great. I mean, I have uh, a CD of the goblin score and i will just listen to it that without even like watching the movie because the music is so cool the murders are like really beautiful but also like really disgusting you know what i mean like open like the open heart with like the stabbing and it's just they're just everything about it is just like beautiful grotesque and i'm super super into that now of course like many italian movies uh, a lot of the set pieces don't actually make much logical sense like you know one of the most famous examples is the woman dying by falling into a room that's inexplicably filled with razor wire, you know? <laughs> <laughs> There's that razor wire room again. She just fell right in there. But none of that even like matters at all. It doesn't matter in the slightest uh, because this movie is just kind of like a sensory experience. Um, it, it's kind of like akin to like a nightmare or a fairy tale or a nightmare about a fairy tale or something like that. I mean, it's a brilliant movie masterpiece. It never gets old for me. And I mean, it's just definitely one for the ages. It will never be replaced. It will never be topped. It's just easily, easily one of my top movies of all time. I mean, I love it. I really, really love it a lot. So that will wrap up 1977. Thanks everybody for dropping by the salon and coming on this very slow going journey with me. And hopefully you enjoyed the video. Remember to like and share if you did, and subscribe to Scare Salon if you haven't already. I also have a site, scaresalon.com, where I post more content, which is like written stuff, movie reviews, book reviews, stuff like that. And be sure to keep watching this space for whenever I put up my next video, which will obviously be 1978. So I will see you guys again on the next one. Bye. And now was acknowledged the presence of the Red Death. Clock went out with